I have a microphone. Am I on, Matt? Great. What a nice crowd. Nice to see you all. Welcome to Chico State. My name is Susan Roll. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement, and we're just so happy to have you all here on our campus tonight. We are most grateful for our partners on this event, the Associated Students here at Chico State and also the League of Women Voters. Forty years ago, I went to my first League of Women Voters meeting. I was eight years old, and I didn't know at that time that my mother was instilling in me a lifelong commitment to community engagement, so it seems fitting that I get to welcome you here tonight. You may not know that the League of Women Voters will be turning 100 years old in two more years, right? Across the country, the League of Women Voters is known for facilitating nonpartisan open forums such as these so that voters like us can be informed, knowledgeable, and engaged. So again, we're so grateful for the partnership of the League of Women Voters and the Associated Students. I hope that you saw the Wildcat statue just outside here. She was purposely placed facing out into the community as we work to find ways to be a welcome and opening campus and seek ways to partner with you here in Chico, in Butte County, and all the way across the North State. Thank you so much for being here. I'd now like to introduce my colleague and partner, Deborah Barger. She is a colleague here on campus, but tonight she is representing the League of Women Voters as the chair. Good evening. I have the privilege of covering the rules. So, the League of Women Voters of Butte County is very pleased to be collaborating this evening with the Office of Civic Engagement and Associated Students of CSU Chico. As Susan indicated, the League of Women Voters was founded in 1920 as a civic organization to encourage informed citizen participation in government and to encourage women to play a larger role in public affairs. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. It is the intent of every candidate forum to provide an opportunity for candidates to present their views on important issues facing Butte County voters. The League of Women Voters is held in high regard for its commitment to fair and unbiased forums. The League forum rules are designed to continue this respected tradition. The forum this evening is being recorded by BCAC TV and will be broadcast in its entirety on Compass Channel 11 on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 a.m. and Saturdays and Sundays at 6 p.m. You can also view the forum online at lwvbuttecounty.org. The League of Women Voters will allow audio or video of the forum to be broadcast in its entirety except by media reporting on the forum. No one will be allowed to edit the footage of the forum for campaign purposes. The candidates have drawn for order of opening and closing statements prior to the beginning of this forum and are seated in the order of the opening statement draw. Each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement and two minutes for a closing statement. Answers to our questions will be limited to one minute. Each question will be answered by each of the candidates. The moderator may adjust the times depending on the time restrictions or complexities of the subject. The audience and lead questions will be read by a moderator. The journalists will ask questions directly to the candidates when called upon by the moderator. Because this forum is a nonpartisan setting for voters to hear all positions, any demonstrations of support or opposition to the candidates for their positions will be out of order. Any question directed to individual candidates will be discarded because the questions must be posed to all candidates. We will stop candidate questions after 8.15 in order to leave time for statements from each candidate. At the end of the forum, we will thank all the candidates with our applause. Please hold your applause until that time. If you would please self, uh, silence your cell phones now, any other electronic devices that make, make noise, I would appreciate it. I'm now pleased to introduce our moderates for this evening's forum, Claire Green from the League of Women Voters and Kelsey McCraffrey from the Associated Students. Thank you. Good evening. Assisting me this evening are two timekeepers. They are holding indicators marked with one minute, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, 
and a red stop sign. Will you please hold up a sign to show where you are? <laughs> Candidates, if you cannot see the time cards, please let me know now. Can everybody see? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes? Good. <laughs> Please abide by the time limitations so that the evening moves along smoothly. The question screeners over here will sort the questions from the audience into topics, trying to avoid duplications and to screen for personal attacks. Please use clear handwriting on your question cards. Representing the press are Risa Johnson of the Chico Enterprise Record and Oroville Register. Asia Asia Shiraga of the Chico News and Review, and Gray Boyer of the Orion. With us this evening are candidates Jessica Jones Holcomb, Party Preference Democrat, Mary Walters, Party Preference Democrat, Gregory Edward Cheadle, Party Preference Republican, David Peterson, Party Preference Democrat, Louis Elbinger, Party Preference Green, and Audrey Denny, Party Preference Democrat. The incumbent, Doug Lamalfa, Party Preference Republican, declined the invitation citing a scheduling conflict. Now some information about the United States Representative District 1. The United States is divided into 435 congressional districts, each with a population of about 710,000 individuals. Congressional District 1 is 28,000 square miles and is 99% rural and 1% urban. It is located in the northern portion of the state and includes the counties of Siskiyou, Modoc, Shasta, Lassen, Butte, Plumas, Sierra, Nevada, and parts of Glen County. The office for the U.S. Congressional Representative is a two-year term without term limits and will be sworn in next January. The annual salary is $174,000 plus members' representational allowance to help defray expenses resulting from three components, personal expenses, office expenses, and mailing expenses. More information about the office and district can be found on the web. We will begin with the opening statement from Ms. Holcomb. You may now begin. I'm Jessica Holcomb, and I'm running for Congress in our beautiful District 1. And growing up, I was the oldest of seven kids. We're fourth generation Northern Californians, but there were years when we were very poor, and at times we were homeless and without health insurance. And that is why there is a fire in me to fight for Medicare for all, and to ensure that all Americans have access to affordable housing and to increase our reliance on renewable energy. We've come to a crossroads in our country where it's no longer about left or right. It's about right and wrong. It's a matter of protecting our environment and protecting all Americans and ensuring that everyone has access to an opportunity to actually make the American dream real. While I was growing up, there were times when we weren't able to find housing, and there was a campground that took us in so long as my father was willing to collect the garbage. And so I know what people in our district are experiencing, and I'm prepared to fight for them. Thank you. Ms. Walters. Hi, good evening. I'm Marty Walters, and I live in Quincy, California, up in Plumas County. Um, I'm an environmental scientist. I'm also a mom of three young adults who I raised on my own. And I you know, come from the rural part of this region in that 28,000 square miles um, that make up our district. And, and I'm really running to give voice to the rural part of the region and unify us with the rest of California. One thing I've done in my campaigning over the last year is to travel across this region. Um, and Lewis and I had a little argument yesterday about how, what the circumference of the earth is. It's 25,000 miles. And I've gone almost that distance just within our district traveling around to meet people. And one of the things that we um, have really broad agreement about in this district, whether it's political um, affiliation or your socioeconomic background, we all have this major appreciation and value for 
for our um, natural resources in this region and our public land. And that's really why I'm running, it. one of the biggest reasons I'm running is to put forth a vision for this district that allows us to harness the innovation and harness our desire to, um, to preserve and protect our public lands and actually to bring a whole new generation of, of uh, timber industry and wood products to this region that will help us mitigate climate change. And it's something that brings together all of this um, new technology that we're developing for things like nanocellulose and bioplastics and to turn off that spigot of petroleum and move us into this whole new era. And I think that's one of the things that we have to do in this region is to provide people with a positive reason reason to vote uh, for a new candidate and somebody to replace our existing congressman. And so that's what I'm doing. My name is Marty Walters, and I appreciate your support. Mr. Cheadle. <clears throat> I'm Gregory Cheadle. I was not born with the proverbial silver spoon. I'm a product of the inner city. Uh, I always wanted to be a pediatrician, so I went into uh, college. I got my degree in psychology, emphasis in physiological psychology. Went on to do a master's degree in public administration with an option in healthcare administration. And then just as life would have it, uh, my then 20 month old son came down with cancer and just changed my whole plan of life. Uh, ended up going uh, to law school, finished that. I'm an 1856 Republican, so I am not one of the modern Republicans. In 1856, for those of you who don't know, in 1856, white Republicans were lynched and shot and set on fire along with the black slaves that they were trying to free. The point being, those people were sold out to the principles of fairness, justice, and equality. And so I run as an 1856 Republican because that's what I'm about. I'm not about the party and I'm not about profits. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you so much for being here. Mr. Peterson. Thank you. I uh, appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, we are all gathered here in collusion to replace La Malfa. Thank you to our host, League of Women Voters. <clears throat> My fellow candidates, appreciate you being here. I am the extreme progressive Democrat in this race. My name is David Peterson. I want no money in politics. I want to take the profit out of war profiteering, defund domestic spying, prevent Wall Street financial schemes, legalize residential solar, and Medicare for all single payer. My legislative agenda will disrupt Washington, D.C. I challenge establishment Democrats. I sta challenge establishment Republicans. Who wants no money in politics? Thank you. Unfortunately, unlimited money in politics is the law of the land. Our only defense is to vote against candidates that bring too much money into politics. Who will vote against candidates that bring too much money into politics? Thank you. We have too much money in this race. Establishment Democrats have pushed all of us as candidates to bring in more money. And now we owe favors if we've taken in too much money. And that doesn't fly, because in this district, the voters know that establishment Democrats are just as corrupt as establishment Republicans. And they won't oust the incumbent. Our only chance is to replace him with a progressive Democrat. That's me, David Peterson. But it's not about me. It's about the legislation that I will champion and deliver for you. Mr. Elbinger. My name is Louis Elbinger, and I'm the Green Party candidate for the Office of U.S. Representative for the 1st Congressional District of California. My candidacy exists to give choice and voice to the progressive Bernie Sanders movement. It isn't about me, and it isn't about Bernie Sanders. It's about the movement. In 2016, Bernie Sanders won almost 50,000 votes in this district. 
he won 10 of the 11 counties in the district. I was one of those 50,000 people, and I feel that I do not have a representative in Congress right now. So I thought, surely someone's going to step up and someone's going to going to run uh, to represent my values, and my interests, and my vision. It didn't seem to happen, and it finally dawned on me that if I didn't do it, it wouldn't get done. So who am I? I'm a retired Foreign Service officer who served 28 years in the, in the US Department of State in 16 different assignments in nine different countries. I'm an experienced diplomat. I'm a grandfather. I'm a wise elder. I'm a planetary citizen. I'm a poet. I'm a conscious evolutionary. I'm a conscious activist. I'm a bridge between empire and earth community. I'm a visionary leader. What I am not is I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm not a liberal. I'm not a conservative. I'm not an ideologue, and I'm not an extremist. I'm simply a human being who wants to leave the world a little bit better than he found it. Thank you. Ms. Denny. Good evening. I am thrilled and I'm humbled to be sitting in front of my hometown crowd as a candidate for the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, now, as I see that job, uh, there's two key parts. One, our representatives set policy, and two, they decide how we spend our taxpayer money. Now, if you hear one thing that I say tonight, hear this. The way that we spend our money reflects our priorities and reflects our values. And right now, we have a Congress who prioritizes and who values massive tax cuts to corporations and to the wealthiest among us at the expense of working class Americans. And I am here to tell you that I have been to the corners of our district. I have talked to farmers and foresters. I've talked to parents and teachers. I've talked to healthcare workers and law enforcement officers. And we do not, the regular people in this district do not value tax cuts to the wealthiest among us. We value equity in education. We value making sure that people don't die because they don't have health insurance. We value protecting and serving our environment. We value serving our veterans. We value investing in our rural communities and our local food systems. And these are the shared common values that we come around. These aren't partisan values, but when we come out of our partisan corners, we can see these shared common values and we can decide that there is more that unites us than there is that divides us. And that is where we can start making real, lasting, positive change for the people, the real people, you guys, that live in this district. All right, thank you so much, candidates, for your opening speech. We will now begin with the first question. The Orville Dam produced a significant financial cost to the entire community, yet no federal financial aid has yet occurred, as well as three major fires. What steps can be taken to, quote, make Orville whole? We'll start with Ms. Walters. So the Oroville Dam was built for a couple of reasons. One was for flood control, and the federal government helped um, you know, pay for the flood control aspect of it. The other reason was to provide water for our agricultural regions and, and then mainly for the Southern California water users, contractors that pay for that water. And, um, you know, I live in the, in the watershed above Oroville Dam, and last year we had one of these tremendous um, rain events that just happened all winter long that created this enormous problem. Um, you know, the federal government does not pay for operations and maintenance on infrastructure. It's one of the things that people People often don't realize that they don't pay for infrastructure maintenance. They only pay for the initial cost. And that's something that we need to either change or we need to really get that cost of the, of the repair of Oroville taken care of under the FEMA program. And that's something that your congressman needs to fight for. Um, overall, you know, when we are thinking about infrastructure like dams, it's something that is a multi-generational obligation for us. And that's something that we always have to take really seriously anytime we're thinking about new um, infrastructure in this region, is what is that obligation going to be? Who's going to maintain it over the long term? And how are we going to ensure that it's being done to a standard that's not just the standard at the time it was constructed, but the standard that is applicable today. Thanks. Thank you. And as a reminder, we have a one-minute speaking time. We'll now proceed with Mr. Cheadle. You know, just for clarity, can you ask that question again? Because I think I missed the first part of it. Absolutely. 
Orville Dam produced a significant financial cost to the entire community, yet no federal financial aid has yet occurred, as well as three major fires. What steps can be taken to, quote, make Orville whole? Well, <clears throat> part of the problem is that there are so many, so many projects that are in need of repair. The, the infrastructure itself is a mess. Uh, when it comes to Oroville Dam specifically, uh, given especially the events that occurred recently, you know, the thing's about to just collapse. And so we, we have to look at that seriously and, and find a way uh, to fund not only Oroville Dam, but these other dams, because if, if we don't, the old expression, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I hate to date myself, but anyway. Uh, we've got to emphasize prevention rather than letting these things uh, go and become disasters because it's far cheaper to deal with it on this side than to let that thing uh, blow up and what a mess that would be. Mr. Peterson? So you asked specifically what uh, can we do to make Oroville whole again? And um, obviously the cost of the repair is significant and you're asking for a champion to go to Congress and ask for more money, and, and I would. And, and I agree with uh, both candidates before me and well is it, that it's important to keep things maintained, it's important to keep them up to the latest standards, and we haven't. Nationwide, so much infrastructure has just been let go and that's just bad government. So we need to do a lot better job. And on the preventative maintenance side, uh, the forest fires that you mentioned, absolutely we need to do a much better job maintaining our forests. They are a mess and we haven't been maintaining them and we are at risk for many more fires in the near future. Mr. Elbinger. The Green Party has 10 values and the very first value is ecological wisdom, which is also tied into indigenous wisdom. Dams are a 19th century solution to a 21st century problem. The Green Party advocates water capture, collection, and reuse for the, for the problem that we face of storage of water in uh, California. Last Wednesday, I spoke at the Nevada County Irrigation District meeting about the Centennial Dam that they're proposing. The Centennial Dam would, would help to uh, destroy the, uh, the Bear River, and I took a stand against it in coordination with the people in uh, Nevada City, in Grass Valley. So I'm saying 21st century solutions to 21st century problems. Thank you. Miss Denny. So the Orville Dam is the tallest dam in the United States, and Southern California would not exist how it exists now without the Orville Dam. And yet the true irony is that it is nestled and housed within one of the poorest communities in the state. Um, and for me, the, the Orville Dam and, and the history, the legacy of broken promises that, that represents from our government is really the epitome of some of our, our key issues facing the district. We, are, we have been forgotten and we have been left behind. Um, and Orville and the community of Orville and what they've suffered over the last 60 years is, is the example of that. Um, I know many of you in this room are still trying to process the trauma that we experienced in February last year. Um, I was less than a block from here those, those three days coordinating, oh my God, I didn't get there yet. One minute goes fast. Recru Orville Settlement Agreement, we need to make sure that when we bring those diverse stakeholders together, including DWR, that we get money for recreation, for tourism, for our local businesses, and we need to make sure that reparations are made to the people of Orville. <laughs> I'm not messing around. And finally, Ms. Holcomb. So Oroville Dam, like 15 other dam, 1,500 other dams throughout the nation, is considered to be in crisis. And the, the irony of this is that there are lots of proposals out there to build new dams, which would cost billions of dollars, instead of repair our current infrastructure, as well as the pipelines that transport the water so that communities can get access to that water. We're losing not only a lot of water through those pipelines, but we have corroded pipes. And so I would sponsor the Rebuild America Act, which would invest over $13 billion in our infrastructure nationwide, including repairs to the Oroville Dam. And I would also sponsor legislation to provide additional funding to ensure that we have 
fire prevention, just as we saw on the Bidwill Trail near Oroville, and also make sure that our <coughs> communities that are monitoring uh, fires have access to cutting edge um, technology to prevent the devastation that we've seen from forest fires. Thank you. Thank you. Now a question concerning presidential authority and military attacks. Do you believe that the president should authorize military attacks in Syria and other trouble spots without congressional approval? And we will start with Mr. Cheadle. No. Mr. Peterson? I agree with my fellow candidate, and I believe that Congress should respond to every military action immediately, uh, setting a limit of seven days to vote on every military action and any activity that occurs in the next 30 days, and they should be responsible to vote within 30 days for any action that takes place over the next six months. And if they don't, they should be fired. They should be sent home. They need to take responsibility for every military action from genocide in Yemen to the latest bombing raid in Syria. If our Congress members can't be held responsible, who can? Mr. Elbinger. I bring 28 years of experience in the Foreign Service to this question. To me, it's obvious. It seems to me to be, to be I call it a no-brainer. Of course, Congress has to have a say in this, because the people have to pay the price for this sort of thing. I was a freelance journalist in Vietnam in December of 1967. And unlike many of the people who talk about war, I've actually seen the ravages of war with my own eyes. And I reported on it for the Michigan State News. So I've been working on this subject for over 50 years of my life. And in order to, in order to make sure that the people have a say, War has got to be the last, not the first resort in the resolution of problems. The State Department has been hollowed out by the current administration. I would like to see, I would like to see 50,000 Foreign Service officers so that students could study to be Foreign Service officers and go out there and help to make peace. Thank you. Ms. Denny. So when I signed my declaration of candidacy, I took an oath to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic. Um, that was the greatest honor of my life, and that is the, the sense that I will take in to serve you in Congress. Um, while I, I agree with Lewis, I absolutely believe that military action should be our last resort, and we need to beef up our gutted State Department so we have the people in the field to do the work. Um, in terms of, of taking the power to declare war, that's Congress's job, and we need to re- I'm, just, I'm watching you. We need to retake the, um, reinstate and re reuse the um, authorization for military force um, that's been about 16 years, 16 years since they've really been, been paying attention to that in Congress. Um, and so I do believe that that is, is very, very important that we need to, to stand up and make, make those tough calls when tough calls need to be made. It needs to be the role and responsibility of Congress. Thanks for the question. Ms. Holcomb. No, absolutely not. We cannot allow the president to act as a dictator and an authoritarian figure in making decisions about sending America to war without obtaining the permission of Congress. Even though constitutionally the president is the commander in chief, if we allow someone, especially under the current administration, who may not necessarily be the most emotionally stable, to be able to take matters into his own hand to declare war, he could pull the entire nation into a conflict uh, that would result to the detriment of all Americans and jeopardize the security of our world. So it is imperative that we have Congress involved in such a significant decision. Ms. Walters. Well, without repeating um, what other folks says, I really strongly think that the authorization for use of military force is the key item that we need to fix in this situation in order for Congress to actually exert its will appropriately. And, you know, Barbara Lee, a congressman um, who comes from Berkeley, you know, she has constantly since 2001 tried to get Congress to engage and to come back and talk about what the scope of that post 9-11 AUML is. And you know we have not 
whether it's Democrats and Republicans, we have not come back to the table to talk about that. And that's something that we need a whole new crop of Congress people to come in and actually, you know, take that seriously, do the hard decisions, have difficult discussions, and talk about what those boundaries should be, because we cannot continue to have this endless scope and this endless time frame and this endless conflict that's been going on for the last 18 years, 17 years. Thank you. Now we have a question regarding tribal relations. Are you willing to work with local tribes and tribal members on issues that affect them and their, and their ancestral lands? We will start with Mr. Peterson. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would. Um, I've had the opportunity, actually, they've uh, made it to a few forums and shared some of their concerns, um, primarily uh, water. Um, the, the destruction of the Klamath River, the destruction of the salmon habitat, the construction of their home, and um, I absolutely would uh, work with them, talk with them, and it's a huge objective of mine to restore the habitat. Um, I want to see more wildlife habitat. It's ridiculous that we have allowed so many areas to be destroyed. Mr. Elbinger? Yes, I come from Mount Shasta, and we work with the Winnemum Wintu tribe I'm trying to, to, to preserve access to our water. There's a Japanese uh, multinational corporation that wants to pump the water out of Mount Shasta and sell it. Um, we've been, I've, I stood with Standing Rock, I still stand with Standing Rock and what, they're st what, they, what they mean. The, the indigenous people of the world have been oppressed to a great extent, and now with new technology, the consciousness of this is coming into our, our view. I think we can have ceremonies of reconciliation where we can come together and we can, we can reconcile some of the problems that have occurred in the past so that we can go forward into the future the, to the seventh generation uh, in a way that is positive. Um, and once again, the, the Nisenan tribe down there in Nevada County is working to, to, um, to protect the Bear River. So in answer to the question, strong yes, I stand with the indigenous people all the time in my role as congressperson representing this district. Thank you. Ms. Denny? Absolutely. Folks, we, we have a lot of work to do to heal some of the historic wounds that we have inflicted upon our indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, and in, in my campaign, we're already trying to start healing some of those wounds. We're sitting down and meeting with folks with, from the Nevada City Rancheria and from the Karuk tribe and the Machupta tribe to, to learn more about their needs and how we can represent them in Congress, but most importantly, how we can continue to fight for their sovereignty and in some, of, in some cases help them fight for federal recognition that has been denied to them. Um, and then fight to make sure that the individuals in those populations who are some of the most marginalized, victimized folks in society have access to the basic services that they deserve. So absolutely. Ms. Holcomb? Yes, absolutely. And my background as an attorney is particularly helpful with respect to working with tribes and the federal government, as well as state elected officials, because the tribes from a legal standpoint are in a very unique position. There are certain rights that have been bestowed upon them by the federal government, but they also have to interface with the rights of the state. And so being able to balance all of those interests from a legal standpoint is something that I'm attuned to uh, because of my legal background. I'm also opposed to the Centennial Dam in the southern part of our district for environmental reasons and also because it impedes upon the, the lands, the spiritual lands, of the local tribe. And so I greatly respect uh, the, the interests of our local tribes in preserving their spiritual lands and preserving their culture. Ms. Walters? You know, talk is cheap, and we've shown that over many, many years that we often talk about um, respecting and working with tribal leaders and tribal people in this region. And we haven't really done a great job of it. Um, you know, the, the patchwork quilt of both tribal lands and the way that our um, geography works in this region has led to a lot of discontinuity in terms of both the culture, but also the natural resources. Um, one of the things I'm doing right now is working with the governor's office on upper watershed management. So this is the, the upper watershed and how we're actually gonna be preserving water in those areas 
areas, and that group is all about bringing together all of these different state agencies, federal agencies, the Forest Service, and the tribal leaders. So we, last year we met in um, in, in um, Plumas County, and this year we're going to be meeting up in uh, Modoc County to really think about how we're going to proceed forward with that. Thank you. And Mr. Sheedle. <clears throat> you know, I'm amazed at the arrogance of this country, of, of our government. You know, it was alluded to the, the wounds of the Native people. When, when you look at and, and think about the Indian Removal Acts, the Seminole Wars, you know, coming and, and robbing the Natives of their lands, and then having the audacity to move them on a trail of tears. Unequivocally, I would work with the Indian tribes. Thank you. We will now take some questions from the press. We will start with Ms. Shiraga of the Chico News and Review. Okay, this is working, good. <laughs> All right, here's my question. Um, the U.S. spends more money on health care than any developed country at 18% of the gross domestic product. Despite that, health outcomes are poorer and life expectancy is shorter. What should we do to fix health care in America? We will start with Mr. Elbinger. Well, it's been the position of most of the people on this panel that we need affordable and we need to expand Medicare for all. Expanding Medicare for all would be ultimately cheaper than the, the, the insurance companies are taking a profit out of this. And this is why we never got the um, Affordable Care Act, never got, never got implemented. So the, the position of the progressive Bernie Sanders movement and my position and the position of the Green Party is that we need affordable health care for all. And, um, and that's how are we going to pay for that? I think that the defense budget is rather big. It's got $700 billion in it. And that's just the tip of it, because there'll be supplementals that will increase it to a trillion. So my solution is to take part of, this, of, the, of the defense budget and use it to pay for Medicare and for education for all. Thank you. Ms. Denny. It's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy that in 2016, in this country, 36,000 Americans died as a result of a lack of health insurance. I agree, we need to be headed towards a Medicare for all single payer system. But folks, that's, that's not the only health care challenges we're experiencing in our district. The real big challenges we're facing are because we're so rural, right? People don't have access to the doctors that we need. We need to be investing in programs to recruit and train young people from our communities and then supporting them through med school so we can keep and recruit doctors to be in our rural communities. We need to be supporting and investing in our federal qualified healthcare facilities and training our EMTs to be community healthcare workers in those systems. We need to be allowing our, our nurses to work at the top of their professions and to provide services because we don't have the folks that we need, we are medically underserved across the district. Um, and so we need to think broadly, but we also need to think specifically for our district. Ms. Holcomb. So growing up, there were many years when we didn't have <coughs> health insurance. And I recall a day when my mom took my younger sister to the doctor uh, because she had an ear infection. And the doctor wouldn't see us because we didn't have insurance. And my sister lost her hearing in that ear. This is completely unacceptable. We are the only nation, the only developed nation, that does not provide some form of universal health care to all of its citizens. And the solution is Medicare for all. It would actually save us money because we would cut out the private insurance companies who've been charging a markup to make profits for their shareholders, and we would be able to negotiate better rates with pharmaceutical companies to drive the cost of health care down. This is the best solution for America. It's the only solution that's viable to ensure everyone has access to health care, and it's fully doable. Thank you. Ms. Walters. 
So we have this incredibly complicated healthcare system in the United States. You know, it ranges from the VA uh, system where all the doctors and the hospitals are owned and, and employed by the US government. Um, you know, it includes things like Medicare where, um, you know, it's a combination between private and, and public um, insurances and sources of funding. It includes things like, you know, uh, employer plans where the employers and, and employees are paying most of that cost. So we're not gonna get to, um, you know, you, uh, Medicare for all just with a snap of the finger. It's going to really take a lot of work to get there. Um, I actually have a handout on my table outside that you can pick up on your way out. I just printed them this afternoon that gives uh, a little bit of a roadmap for how we're going to get there. And again, I think we need to not only have a universal approach to providing health care to people, but also a comprehensive approach so that we're not um, we're not in a situation where uh, folks are having to make really difficult choices about um, what health care they're able to get because they can't afford the premiums or they can't afford the deductibles on their programs. Thank you. Mr. Cheadle. National health care expenditures are $11,000 per capita. Medicare, 11000 per enrollee. Uh, we have 50,000 people dying a year from drug overdoses. We have 100,000 people dying from hospitalization. And we have 1.7 million hospital-acquired infections. The only way we're going to reduce anything is to stress prevention and personal responsibility. A nation filled with alcoholics, uh, drug addicts, and drug abusers, legal and illegal, uh, tobacco, there's no in the world that we can, as a society, handle those costs. Another thing is that we have this burgeoning amount of vaccines that our children are being given. There's undoubtedly an increase in uh, aut autism spectrum disorder and also an increase in autoimmune diseases. And those are the future. Those kids coming in with those various diseases is going to add to the problem that we have in addition to the, the plague of diabetes and the woman waving the stop sign. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Peterson. So I worked um, for years as a legislative advocate for the Affordable Care Act. And the opposition kept saying that if you bring in the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, we're going to go bankrupt. That didn't happen. And we've saved lives. In fact, my brother was one of the people that didn't have insurance because his employer and his wife didn't have insurance. And when they finally went to the doctor, first the kids went, then the wife went. When he went, he was diagnosed with cancer, stage 4C. He would have died within three months. He's doing great now. My friends and family uh, in the healthcare industry, they get to go home and they're in the emergency room. The Affordable Care Act works, and now Bernie Sanders has made the Medicare for All mainstream. And I was going to say that every Democrat running this year is for Medicare for All, except I guess Marty's not. So we're down one. Thank you. We will now take a question from Ms. Johnson of the Chico Enterprise Record and Oroville Register. Okay. Uh, what should the federal response to the abundance of mass shootings in schools and elsewhere in the U.S. be? Yeah. Great question. Sorry, it's me first, right? <laughs> yes, thank you. We'll start with Ms. Denny. <laughs> Jumping in there. Um, federal response to mass shootings. Um, in California, we have some of the strictest gun safety legislation in the country. Um, and between 93 and 2016, um, our, our gun violence Deaths drop 56%, and the rest of the country, they drop 16%. So we have a lot to do at the federal level to bring other states' gun safety legislation up to where ours in California are. And there's a couple of low-hanging fruit, common shared values that we can get done right away. Those are expanding the background check system, closing the gun show loophole, banning bump stocks and binary triggers, high capacity magazines, um, and making sure that we're implementing restraining orders for family members. So family members, when they feel like they're, someone in their family is violent or potentially violent, you can take that order to a judge. It's called a gun violence prevention order and make sure that, that those firearms get taken away. Ms. Holcomb. 
I was humbled and honored here in Chico to be invited by the students, some of them students here at Chico State, to talk about common sense gun laws. And they had invited Doug LaMalfa, who didn't come. They had a big cutout of him. And I'm so disappointed that he didn't come as our sitting congressman, because this isn't a tangential issue. This is a matter of life and death. And there are common sense gun laws that can be passed which should have long been passed after the Vegas massacre and after what we saw in Florida. For example, bump stocks should have been banned long ago. The background checks at gun shows and for private sales should have been implemented. And we have to implement a ban on semi-automatic weapon sales. To, if we could save just one life from these measures, wouldn't it be worth it? Thank you. Ms. Walters. So at the federal level, the thing that I feel we could make the biggest impact with is by fixing the background check system and really making it work. We have a huge number of different kinds of agencies at the federal and state level that have to work with the background check system and they struggle to get the information into the system and they struggle to get the information out of the system. That is just not acceptable for a society like ours that, ha that can design Facebook to do, um, steal all your information. You know, we ought to be able to get it right. So first and foremost, I think that we need to fix our background system and make it work and make it comprehensive. Um, it, should, it should be apl applicable to all transactions. Um, I also agree that we need to define and determine what kinds of weapons we're not going to allow when it comes to assault rifles and all other kinds of assault weapons. And that's a conversation that we have to have without our friends at the NRA and in the gun manufacturing lobby. Mr. Cheadle. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting. The, the first gun laws were against blacks. Blacks could not own guns because whites were afraid, this was shortly after slavery, whites were afraid that we were going to kill them. And so here we are today, and it's pretty much the same thing. You know, a few people, and not to take this lightly, but when there's a, a mass shooting with whites, all of a sudden there's an uproar. More blacks are killed in a week than all these whites who are killed in these mass shootings, yet the emphasis goes to white and what we must do to protect whites, basically. And I hate to sound so blunt, but this is, this is real. And so the real issue is not so much what we can do to protect whites, but what we can do to protect everyone because blacks are being killed in record numbers and that goes silent. And so we have to look at everybody, not, the mass, not just only the mass shootings, but we have to look at all these this, the shootings in the inner city, Chicago, uh, Cleveland, Detroit, um, Baltimore, LA. <laughs> I, I just want to Mr. Peterson. Thank you. I have to agree with uh, all of my fellow candidates. Um, it's, it's time to do something, and uh, now is the time. This is when things are going to change in 2018. I attended the uh, town halls for representatives McNerney and DeSaulnier, and they're talking to everyone, and they want to take those steps to bring all of the gun safety laws from California to the nation. And even Fox News has run a survey, and their viewers are in support of all of these new guidelines. And um, primarily, we need to take the investment in the emotional health issues. That's, that addresses the... Um, the mass shootings, but in terms of what Mr. Cheadle raised, in terms, it's just access to guns, and we need to <clears throat> reduce the access to guns and make a difference. And the, our two representatives, they're waiting and expecting us on this stage to shift the balance in Congress and make it happen. Mr. Elbinger. Jessica, Gregory, and I also all attended the Never Again rally at the El Rey Theater here in Chico. And I was, I was surprised at the tremendous amount of uh, unanimity, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, because to me it seems like common sense, um, banning the assault rifles, improving the background checks, 
um, giving attention in, uh, medic to medical and uh, mental health issues. These are all things that can and should be done. There's tremendous amount of unanimity on this, on this issue, and I have to say uh, I, I go along with that. There's something that Bernie Sanders said, though, that I liked very much. He said, let's make a distinction between the rural and the urban gun problem. The situation is a little bit different there, and we have to, we have to make different, one size does not fit all. This is true in government tremendously, so we have to keep that in mind, that solutions for the urban areas and solutions for the rural areas may be different. Thank you. Thank you, and now a question from Mr. Boyer of the Orion. Thank you. Student food and housing insecurity is one of Chico State's top priorities and a significant national issue. It's due to financial insecurity of students and funding for the educational system. A recent study showed that 48% of students faced food insecurity in the past month. Of those food insecure students, 64% reported housing insecurity and 15% reported homelessness. What will you do to help these students? We'll begin with, with Ms. Holcomb. I completely understand what the students are facing. So fortunately, because of federal financial aid, I was able to go to college and later on to law school, but that financial aid wasn't sufficient to cover all costs associated with housing or for food. And it got to the point when I was in my senior year, when I <laughs> bounced a rent check, uh, that I got a job as a nanny with a family so I could live in their basement, and there were still times when I was hungry. And in order to solve this problem, we have to provide tax incentives and grants and federal funding for affordable housing for our students and for our seniors, and also to make housing available not just for rent temporarily, so that someone who's going through a transition period has a place to stay, but also to be able to buy a home. Because for many people going into uh, their senior years, this is their largest asset. This is their single sense of security. And we have to make that dream of home ownership possible. Thank you. Ms. Walters. So I have three young adult kids, and I've been um, paying for college and housing for them uh, for the last, I think it's now been six years <laughs> while, they're, while they're going through school. Um, it is incredibly hard. And you know, the thing that for me is the most important is we can, we, you know, we can give free tuition, but by far in California right now, the cost of, of living, the cost of housing and food um, is exceeding what we pay for most of our state schools. So that is actually the bigger cost. And we need to have programs that will take care of not just the cost for going to school, but how we're actually going to live there. And that means, you know, the schools have to start stepping up and really make it part of the program. I think we we, you know, we um, both at the community college level and at the u university level leave it to these kids to figure things out way too much. And we need to have much, much more of a safety net and a system to, pr to help kids find housing. These universities need to provide a lot more affordable housing within the university towns. Thanks. Mr. Cheadle. You know, as a real estate broker, one of the things that I find fascinating is, is the price of property. What determines the price of property? But we're at the point in society and in time where universities and corporations are going to have to build their own housing complexes for their employees and for their students. Uh, when you look at the, the appreciation of a property, it's ridiculous. And, and the problem with that is that so many people now are relying on that appreciation in order to move on. And so there's this balancing act that we have to do with respect to uh, appreciation and profit. You know, how do we manage that without um, ruining the profit motive and uh, having landlords be available as well? I did. <laughs> okay. Come on. Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Um, absolutely, I support um, the education of all kids and it should be as affordable as possible. So, um, I mean, the fact that uh, students are suffering with housing insecurity and food insecurity is just a tragedy. Um, that shouldn't be the case. Uh, I have three kids in college and, uh, I mean, it's, it's a struggle, um, but you make it work. I mean, uh, you know, you, there's a combination of uh, uh, grant programs and loans and I myself I, my, uh, did uh, the student uh, um, 
student education or jobs that were related to the financial aid. Um, my kids opt to work part time um, on their own at restaurants and stuff. Um, and it's, it's a struggle, but it's definitely worth it. Um, I support it, and I, I don't think we should be overlooking kids that are struggling. Mr. Elbinger. Article 26 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that every, everyone has the right to education. Now, having a right to education doesn't mean that everybody has to go to college, because once again, one size does not fit all. So the, the progressive Bernie Sanders movement and the Green Party and my own, my own political plank includes affordable or, and or free education where it's applicable. And once again, how do we pay for it? I'm looking to the aspects of, of our budget that are not what we call livingry. I studied with Buckminster Fuller. He said, we can transform weaponry into livingry through comprehensive scientific design. And that's exactly what we have to do. What is the opposite of weaponry? Whoever thought of that? Bucky Fuller had to create the word livingry. And that's where I want to see all the money from our taxes go. I want one dollar's worth of value for every dollar's worth of taxes that I spend, and that's a nonpartisan idea. Thank you. Ms. Denny. <sighs> Guys, this is an issue I feel viscerally. I spent 10 years of my life on this campus with you learning and teaching, and I'm looking around and I count about 70 college students in here. That means seven of you, one in 10, seven of you are homeless right now. Um, there is a lot that we can do on a federal level to fix that. We can make college more affordable. We can deal with our student debt crisis so you have money to spend on food and housing. We can make community college free like our Butte County promise. We can invest in things on a national level like the Wildcat Pantry that we have here where you can get not only counseling about how to get your SNAP benefits but also get food free of judgment and free of cost. And then we can look at innovative programs like student loan forgiveness for, for future teachers and people who enter public service careers. There is a lot that we can do to fix this injustice, and I will advocate for you. Thank you, candidates. We now have a question regarding undocumented individuals. <clears throat> what do you see as the future for undocumented individuals and families residing in California and all other states? We'll begin with Ms. Walters. So our situation with undocumented individuals has really been a creation of our economy. Um, you know, we created the situation in which uh, we, we were looking for people to work in very, very low cost jobs and people came to fill those jobs and they happen to be undocumented. You know, that's something that we need to acknowledge and work with and deal with. That legacy, um, especially that was created in the 1990s and, and whose kids are really, you know, um, part of the DACA program and part of this um, effort to try to get uh, DACA kids legalized permanently. Um, so I absolutely support a, um, a Clean Dreamer Act that would bring these folks into um, a permanent residency. Um, I also think that we need to m do a lot better in terms of understanding um, what's the forces of the economy that are driving this kind of um, labor market and opening up that labor market to many more people um, who are guest workers in our country. Mr. Sheetal. And you know, when it comes to uh, undocumented people, <clears throat> my thing is take care of home first. You know, blacks in this country have been given the back of the bus for too doggone long. Everybody who comes over here kicks us further off the bus, and now things like this throw us under the bus. And so I say, take care of home first. You know, uh, Trump is bragging that uh, black unemployment is the lowest that it's ever been. I, I, to me, that's a lie. Not only is it a lie, but also if you look at the average income of blacks versus whites, it's less than half. So let's take care of home first, then we can talk about other groups. Mr. Peterson. Um, regarding international workers, I think we should solve the immigration problem. We should build a better wall. A better wall would be $20 per hour for every international worker, plus 20% tax, payroll tax. 
and that 20% tax should go to their home country to build hospitals, schools, wind, and solar. There's no way that any wall Trump builds is going to be as good as that because people can go over, under, they can fly to Chicago, fly to New York, fly to San Francisco. His wall is going to do nothing, but $20 an hour on payroll as a minimum will make a difference and the impact will be positive on everyone else here. Uh, Silicon Valley, I build financial systems for Fortune 500 companies. The international workers that come in, they start at 50 an hour. So there's lots of opportunity and we're just ignoring the truth. Mr. Elbinger. When I worked at the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi, India, in order to get to my office, I had to walk through lines of visa applicants. As a foreign service officer, I had to give visas, and I know for a fact that some people wait 10 full years to legally immigrate to the United States. So I've been listening to those who are railing against those who have great passion about um, the undocumented workers and trying to understand their feelings. To me, the feelings that they have are like standing in line at the post office and watching someone cut in, in line in front of you. There's a certain amount of anger there. We have to understand that because, I mean, to, in my personal opinion, the issue of the DACA's is, not a, is a no brainer once again. Of course, these people were innocent. How in the world should, why in the world should they be punished for what they've done? Uh, coming into this country. So there would be some sort of amnesty for the DACA people, and we have to get a bipartisan solution to solve the issue of the undocumented workers. Thank you. Ms. Denny. Imagine being five years old, being dropped off at Red Bluff Elementary School, and not being certain that your mom is going to be there to pick you up after school. This is the real thing that, that kids are facing in our communities. We're having ice raids in Gerber. We're having ice raids in Gridley. Kids don't know if their parents are going to be there to pick them up. Um, this is a complex and thorny issue. And we are losing, families are being torn apart, and we're losing people who are contributing hard work and contributing to our local economy. Um, <coughs> we've been trying to get bipartisan immigration reform passed in Congress since George Bush was president. And it's complex and it's thorny. But we need to be centered around the shared common values of the fact that immigrants are part of our diverse culture, but also part of our economy. We need to be advocating for a path to citizenship, for fixing the visa backlog system, for protecting DACA and TPS. Um, so, so our kids, when they go to school, so they know that their parents will be there to pick them up afterwards. Ms. Holcomb. We are ultimately all immigrants. So my great grandparents on my mother's side came here from Croatia and Slovenia. And my great grandmother was a laundress. My great grandfather poured cement. And by the time their great-grandchildren were born, we were able to get college educations. This has been the land of opportunity for all of us. And now we are seeing an administration that is targeting undocumented immigrants as a distraction tactic, as a fear tactic, when in fact we should have long passed the DREAM Act for those children who came into our country undocumented. In addition, I would support the blue card program. <coughs> that's legislation that's been proposed by Kamala Harris and Dianne Feinstein and would provide a path to citizenship for our rural farm workers. Not only do we greatly appreciate who we are as a nation because of our cultural heritage, but immigrants are essential to our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know we could go another couple hours probably, but in order to adjourn on time and leave plenty of room for closing statements, this will be our last question. It's concerning drug policy. What ideas do you have for fixing the nation's drug crisis? And we will begin with Mr. Cheadle. Boy. <clears throat> you know, again, <clears throat> when we had a drug crisis with crack it was labeled an epidemic. Black folk were thrown into prison and jail. And now that whites are exposed to the opioids, it's a crisis. You know, the inconsistency and the unjust treatment of blacks in this country has come to roost. You know, we have got to stop this, the way we treat people of color. You know, it, it's a crisis now. 
and before we were th thrown in jail and in prison, you know, crack babies were, were on that, the, the covers of magazines. I don't see that with opioid. I don't see opioid babies small and, and, and worried about that. So we have to go back and undo the damage that we've done with crack, with this war on drug stuff. We've got to stop, the, you know, incarcerating black men. We've got to stop letting the police just, ugh. Why do you ask these questions and I can't even answer them fully? <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Okay. Well, I agree, absolutely. We need to um, reduce the incarceration of people who are addicted to drugs of any type, of any color, and um, we need to hold accountable the manufacturers and the distributors. Um, the opioid crisis is absolutely mainstream healthcare and it's, it is a crisis, and it's ridiculous that we put up with it. Um, healthcare providers should be accountable for their part, and there should be consequences. Mr. Elbinger. My first job after I graduated from college was to work in a methadone program, and I got some insight. I didn't have a lot of training in it. Uh, I had more of a cultural background, but I got a lot of insight into this, this um, phenomenon. Yes, the war on drugs has to be ended. When I spoke at the uh, Nevada County Cannabis Alliance the other day, I said, when we talk about marijuana, we're talking about, med we're talking about medical use. When we talk about cannabis, we're talking about recreational use. When we talk about ganja, we're talking about ceremonial use. But I like to use cannabis as a gateway drug to talk about consciousness in political discourse. So that's the, way, that's, that's the way I see I see that there's a lot more to the marijuana discussion than just taking it off the uh, class one drug schedule and doing some research into how it can help us uh, medically, recreationally, and ceremonially. Thank you. Ms. Denny. So 2017 was the second year in a row that the American life expectancy was shorter than before. And that is due entirely to death over, by drug overdoses. And so when we look at this problem, I think it's important to first take the lens that this is an addiction issue, and addiction issues require treatment. But they also require community-level holistic responses that account for the education aspect, the public health aspect, the public safety aspect, um, and, and, the, and the adequate standard of living aspect all need to be addressed when we're, when we're treating this this problem holistically, and we have to remember that drugs in Chico are different than drugs in Orville, different than our drug problem, and that's way different than our drug problem in Alturas. So we need federal funding to come up with community-based, locally controlled systems of solutions. Ms. Holcomb. So the drug crisis can be addressed <coughs> in, two, in two steps. So effectively, we can help those who already have criminal records for low-level marijuana possession by passing the Marijuana Justice Act so that they can actually have those records expunged and that marijuana will no longer be on Schedule One. I'm actually in favor of legalizing marijuana so that those states, such as California, where we have growers and small businesses in the cannabis industry, can operate fully in the light and legitimately without worrying about repercussions at the federal level. But in terms of the opioid addiction, so this hits particularly home for my family. My beautiful niece was addicted to heroin, and because of the dearth of affordable and accessible drug centers, our family needed to spend 50 to 60,000 to be able to provide her with treatment. She is now drug free. But we need to make these resources more readily available and affordable to all Americans. Thank you. Ms. Walters. I think tonight we've been hearing some um, encouragement to think about problems as being we have to choose one problem to solve and not another. You know, we can solve and work on all of these problems at the same time. And I strongly um, encourage us not to fall prey to that idea of dividing us um, according to these kinds of issues or the color of our skin. When it comes to the drug problem, absolutely, you know, we need to be thinking about how we're gonna address that from um, the perspective of our families 
and how that works within our medical system here. Um, we have the Northern uh, Counties Opioid Safety Coalition um, that includes my county and a whole bunch of counties north of here. And that's you know specifically geared toward how do you actually manage an ongoing addiction issue safely and have safe use. And again, that means you know you need to provide a whole host of different options for that that fits within our existing medical system. And I think the second thing is we need to just legalize marijuana, take it off the Schedule I drug so that we have other options. Thank you. Thank you for all your thoughtful answers. And it is now in time for your closing statements. The order of the draw is Mr. Peterson, Ms. Walters, Mr. Sheedel, Ms. Holcomb, Ms. Denny, and then Mr. Elbinger. Mr. Peterson, you may begin your two-minute closing statement now. Thank you. Um, I don't know. It seems like it went fast. I was ready for another hour or so. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it's great to uh, see such participation. Um, hopefully we have uh, given you some insight as to our thoughts, but uh, I usually open when I speak to people in this district. I say, what would you like us to fix in Washington, D.C.? Because this needs to be participatory. We need your input. We need your ideas. We need to understand what's going on with you. So. Uh, out in the lobby, I have a survey. Those are my ideas, but I also want to hear your ideas and any solutions you have. We're, that's our responsibility, is to re represent you and take those ideas to Washington, D.C. Thank you. Ms. Walters. Thank you all for coming tonight. It was such a pleasure to be here. You know, I work full time and um, I, I can I campaign um, about the same amount of time every week, about 40 hours a week as well. Um, and I've driven those 24,000 miles around our, our district meeting people. Um, I strongly think that our, our, um, our congressman needs to be somebody who is, um, can, can do the really hard work, put in the effort, and have the stamina to really make that work for our district, because we have a lot of disadvantages. You know, we're so big and we're so spread out, and it's hard to get people um, to talk to us. It, it is something that we really need to spend the time and the effort and, um, and, and really be out there speaking to folks beyond just our centers here in Chico and in Redding um, and in Grass Valley. So that, that's something that I make a, a big pledge to do. You know, right now I'm working on a lot of the issues I talked about earlier relating to uh, sustainable forestry. I'm already working on the governor's task force relating to how are we going to get industry back in this region? How are we going to get companies to come up here and do all of this really innovative technology that's going to allow us to rebuild our economy in this region and bring back vitality that we really need need to get ourselves back in action here. You know, we don't want to be standing on the sidelines while the rest of California works on uh, climate change and we talk about electric cars and we talk about renewable energy and solar panels. We want to be front and center in that action and we can be. You know, we can do that collectively in this region by bringing back sustainable forestry and doing it in a brand new way that's going to turn off the petroleum spigot. It's going to allow us to have good paying jobs and it's going to give us a foundation for success in this region that puts us on par and allows us to you know, access and share in a little bit of California's affluence. I'm Marty Walters, and I really appreciate your support on this campaign. Thank you. Mr. Cheel. Well, first of all, I want to put everyone at ease. I am not an angry black man, <laughs> OK? <laughs> I'm a realist. Uh, when, when Trump came to Reading and, and pointed in that direction and said, that's my African-American, my whole life changed. Um, and with that came so much hatred. America has a race problem that we don't want to deal with. You know, we, we hide under this arrogant statement that we are a nation of immigrants make us feel better. We're a nation of immigrants. First of all, the reality is we are a nation in which immigrants came over here, annihilated the native peoples, stole their land, trafficked and stolen human beings to build their colossal fortunes, and then have the temerity, the bold audacity and foolishness to disallow those groups 
a full, full access to the American dream. And so socially, which also in, in, imposes on us criminal activity, we have got to have people in Congress who are sensitive to those who are of minority groups. I'm Gregory Cheadle, and I am not an angry black man. Cheadle for Congress, thank you very much. <laughs> please, please hold your applause. Ms. Holcomb. So this is the year that you have all been waiting for, 2018. And we're going to make history together by electing our first Congresswoman to District 1. And that Congresswoman is going to fight for Medicare for all. She's going to fight for free public universities. She's going to fight for affordable housing. And she's going to fight to increase our reliance on renewable energy. And I know what so many in our district have been struggling with. While I was out door knocking, I met a man who was blind. And he asked me, is it you? Is it you, Jessica Holcomb, knocking on my door? I said, yes. I'm here and I'm knocking because I serve you. He said, I can't believe it. You made my day by coming here. And that is the reason that I'm running for Congress, is to serve you, to close the gap on wealth inequality, to restore that bridge that helps those who are in poverty reach the other side and be able to have stable lives. My qualifications as an attorney will serve you well in Congress. Not only am I familiar with laws and how to advise clients on regulatory matters, but I also know how to negotiate with opposing sides. I can already anticipate their arguments, and I know how to find common ground. But my passion and my qualifications are not enough. To defeat a, an incumbent like Doug LaMalfa requires colossal resources and an organizational structure. LaMalfa has not seen competition in this district like he has from our campaign. We've outraised him twice. We've raised over a quarter of a million dollars, which is necessary to be able to get our message out. And we have an amazing team that continues to grow. We can do this. We can flip this district. And we can restore the American dream for all Americans. Thank you. Ms. Denny. I got to stand up. This is how I teach. Folks, I am, I am standing before you and humbly asking for your support on June 5th because I am the only candidate who can beat LaMalfa in November. And I say that for two reasons. One, my campaign has shown that we can build the broad enough coalition that is going to take to outseat him. We've activated the progressive Democrats with the Justice Democrats endorsement, our Revolution Chico endorsement. Our no party preference millennials are engaged in a way that this district has never seen. Look around this room. And our campaign is reaching out into the most remote corners of the district and getting farmers and ranchers who traditionally vote conservative to vote for a Democrat for the first time in their lives. Because we are coming together. We're coming together around our shared common values. Folks, and the second reason is that we have the infrastructure to win. We've got two offices, four hubs, five staff members, six amazing college interns. The, the team is there to do the work. But more importantly and more inspiring are the folks that I see around this room. Some of the hundreds of volunteers who are pouring their blood, their sweat, and their souls into this campaign. And you are doing that because you are fighting for social change. And with every door that you knock and every phone call that you make, every text you send, every t-shirt and every piece of swag that you wear, you are fighting for real and lasting social change in our district. And I am proud and I'm honored and I'm humbled to be in that fight alongside you. And I will be your next representative. My name is Audrey Denny. Thank you for your vote. Please hold your applause. And finally, Mr. Elbinger. I felt I should stand up too. I like that idea. <laughs> I want to talk about electability myself. I think it'll be easier to flip a red district green than blue. 
Why is that? People say to me, Lewis, I really like what you're saying, but I don't think a third party can possibly win. When they say that, I have three thoughts. First of all, when I hear a vote for you, Lewis, is a vote for Lamalfa, that's like demanding my vote. We cannot demand votes from other people. We have to earn the votes. You don't come to me and demand a vote. Uh, that's a 20th century political um, approach. In the 20th century, fear and greed was used to get to control people. In the 21st century, it's going to be love and courage. And I, I position myself as a 21st century politician. Secondly, when someone says that, I think they're, what they're really saying is, Lewis, you should lower your voice so that my voice can be heard louder. When I hear that, I, I just look people in the eyes and say, that's not going to happen because I have something to say, and it's something that needs to be said and something that needs to be heard, the message of the progressive Bernie Sanders movement. And thirdly, I think about voting your conscience. Robert Reich made a, made a, uh, a short little video about this, about why third parties were not a good idea, a good way to go. And I disagree with him. I think voting your conscience is why we're on earth, living with our conscience. I'm telling you folks that, that the more people who get in touch with their conscience, the better it's going to be for all of society. So I feel that when the more people vote their conscience, that I will, I will win on June 5th, no matter what happens in the polls. So in the end, I would just say, if you vote Republican or Democrat, you make a point. If you vote Green, you make history. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Butte County, CSU Chico Office of Civic Engagement, CSU Chico Associated Students, my co-moderator, Kelsey, who is actually part of the speech and debate team and not associated students, we failed to acknowledge that earlier, uh, and, and BCAC TV, we thank the candidates for participating in the forum this evening. You may now applaud. United States Representative District 1 form is now adjourned. Thank you all very much for coming.